Wake up, wake up, it's time to be free. Wake up, wake up, what's blind now I see. Wake up, wake up, it's time to be me. Wake up, wake up, my mind is the key. Wake up, it's time to be me. Wake up, wake up, my mind is the key. <laughs> So welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Julian Gordon here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Daily Jewels, where I drop nuggets of wisdom to help you increase your degrees of freedom. I don't care how many college degrees you have, because the only degree that really matters is your degree of freedom. I don't care how much money you make, because what really matters is actually how you make money. And so today I want to talk about um, how free you actually feel at work, whether you're an employee or entrepreneur. I want to talk about how free you feel at work. Um, for me, I know that this hits home because, uh, you know, I stepped out from uh, traditional employment into self-employment. And what I found is that I quickly became a workaholic. In fact, I was actually the worst boss that I had ever had in my entire life. Um, I was like a slave driver. Um, I didn't stop. I worked countless hours. And this is part because I bought into the narrative around hustling hard and burning yourself out and sleep when you're dead and things of that nature. Um, that's what I thought I needed to succeed. And um, I found other ways to actually make extreme progress without burning myself out and giving up the things that I value and that are sacred to me. And so since work takes up a, such a big part of our lives, I want to talk about how free you feel at work. Um, because this is really important. So when you look at your life, right, if you look at it on this um, time scale of zero, and I think the average American lives to about 79, 80, um, work is like, work is like this big chunk of time here. And you got one third of your life is just going to sleep, right? One third of your life is sleep and work is this big chunk. And so if we don't feel free at work, right, Monday through Friday, um, which during this, uh, our adulthood is actually five sevenths of our life, right? If you work a five day work week, um, then it's going to be impossible to have a life that ultimately feels free. The numbers just don't match up. If five of your days uh, don't feel free uh, out of seven in a week, um, that's how you're going to feel, right? So we have to make sure that this big chunk of time, uh, which is work, um, has to feel good. Now, a lot of people who actually hate their work um, they seek to retire early or sell their company as quickly as possible because um, <clears throat> they're not happy inside of it. And uh, my challenge would be, why not just find some work that you love doing? Because oftentimes when people sell and they have or they retire and they have nothing else meaningful to live for, even if they hated what they did, um, that's when they start to get depressed. Right. So it's not about the absence of work. Uh, I don't think freedom is about the absence of work. Some people believe it is. And that's OK. There are tons of different brands of freedom out there. But since work is such a big part of our lives, I want to talk about how we can actually be f more free at work. So <clears throat> um, there are degrees of freedom in every aspect of your life. There are degrees of freedom. There are degrees of freedom with money. Right. If you're living paycheck to paycheck, you have um, you have. Uh, you are at like zero, right? If you're living paycheck to paycheck, if you're actually in debt and your expenses are more than even what you're bringing in, um, you have even negative degrees of freedom. Then you might have a degree of freedom where uh, you have a little bit of a cushion, right? A little bit of a cushion. Um, then you might have a degree of freedom in terms of money where you have uh, more than enough, right? More than enough. And you can even give and, and donate and things of that nature. And then you have a degree of freedom where your passive income, passive income uh, meets, meets needs. Um, and financially, when it comes to financial freedom, because a lot of people only focus on financial freedom, if that's when I believe you achieve financial freedom. When your passive income, money that you make, even when you're sleeping, actually meets your monthly needs. That's uh, another degree of freedom. And then there's a uh, degree of freedom that's even higher, which is beyond that, right? Where you have assets and uh, passive income that is producing um, way more than whatever you could possibly need. So um, there are degrees of freedom in money. There's degrees of freedom in relationships. There's degrees of freedom in health, right? Some people are confined to a wheelchair right now. That's a, a degree of freedom. Um, but there are people who are confined to a wheelchair who are still out there active because they're not going to let that um, define them, right? <laughs> if you've ever seen the I think it's called Paralympics or something like that. They're playing hoop um, more than I play hoop sometimes, right? So uh, 
just because you are in a particular place and that you are experiencing a particular condition doesn't have to that doesn't actually have to limit your freedom in, in, in totality. So this is degrees of freedom in terms of money, right? But I actually want to talk about degrees of freedom at work. And I think there's really six particular types of degrees of freedom at work or criteria um, in which um, you can consider whether or not or determine how free you are in terms of your work. Okay. And so um, this is uh, how I actually evaluated uh, my workaholic behaviors and started to make changes. Right. So the first one, um, the first one is really uh, in terms of uh, work is, do you have freedom to choose what you work on? Do you have freedom to choose what you work on? So when I went from employee to self-employed, notice I don't say employee uh, to entrepreneur. A lot of people think that the moment that they quit their job and, the, and they get an LLC or they buy a domain name that they're an entrepreneur, um, I think there's a phase in between entrepreneurship, true entrepreneurship, and um, traditional employment called self-employment where you have literally just created a job for yourself. And that's what I found myself in, even though I thought I was an entrepreneur. But <clears throat> as somebody who was self-employed, um, uh, what I had the choice to do was work on what I wanted to work on. And for me, that was my purpose. Um, I was at an organization that was great, it's doing great work in the world, but it wasn't fully aligned with my purpose. I learned a lot of skill sets there. I love the community that I serve, but it wasn't, I knew it wasn't my purpose. Um, and so uh, I wanted to work on what I wanted to work on. Now, um, whether you're an employee or entrepreneur, oftentimes you find yourself um, doing things uh, and the what that you're working on is not what you actually want to be working on. And, and what tends to happen is, uh, especially um, in entrepreneurship and in, in traditional employment, we tend to get great at things that we hate. We get great at things that we hate. And what happens when you get great at something you hate? You simply attract more of what you hate. So why not just get great at that which you actually love? Right. And become known for that um, in your industry or in your company. So that's the first degree of freedom uh, in work. Do you have uh, freedom to choose what you are actually working on? Um, do you have enough space to say, I believe that this is going to create value. I have trust from my team, whether that's uh, employment or entrepreneurship uh, to actually go work on this and actually bring back value. So the second one is, um, do you have freedom uh, around who you work with. And <clears throat> for traditional employment, um, that's usually not the case. Unless you are the manager and you're hiring, um, oftentimes you don't have freedom there. It's kind of like siblings. You're kind of born into a particular family and you got to figure out how to deal with it. Um, and so, but with an entrepreneurship, you have a little bit more freedom. Uh, we just went through a hiring process. Uh, we are hiring two people here. And out of all the great candidates that applied, uh, these are two people that I am really excited to work with, right? And so freedom to choose who you want to work with. But this is not just uh, your, your colleagues. Um, this is not just your colleagues. Uh, uh, I think that's it, colleagues. Um, this is also your clients. Do you, get, do you have freedom to choose who you are actually serving? So there's some people who uh, work at Fortune 500 companies and then they're serving companies that um, they don't want to serve, right? Um, that don't align with their values, right? If I'm a consultant um, at McKinsey and you ask me to go do a consulting project uh, for Philip Morris, the cigarette company, um, that's not working with who I want to work with. I don't, I don't buy into that. And there's nothing against cigarette smokers. It's just not aligned with my values, right? And I'll tell you a more personal story. Um, I actually was hired um, by a defense contractor um, to actually work with some of their millennial employees. And, <clears throat> and after, um, after doing the actual presentation for this company who's, um, who actually makes bombs, honestly, and missiles, um, I felt really bad. I felt really, really bad. And here I was an entrepreneur or self-employed and I could have chose to say no, but I let the money that was on the table actually dissuade me from actually living in alignment with my values. But because I am self-employed, I could move on to the next client relationship, look at the next deal and actually make a better decision. If you are an employee, um, you usually have to go do that work, whether you align with the values of this company or not. Right. And so this is a real 
real key one. There's also research that shows uh, a lot of uh, our happiness and joy actually come from our work relationships. So we spend more time with our colleagues at work than we actually do with our significant others. So who you work with is really, really key, right? Um, the next one is when you work. When you work, do you have control over when you actually work? Do you have control over when you actually work? Um, a lot of people are still on the clock. Even salaried people, they're on the clock. Um, but if you're a night owl and you're salaried, if you work better in the evening, you should be able to come in at 11 and leave at 8 if that's what you want to do. Um, and if you're a morning person like I am, you should be able to come in at 6 and leave at 3. And in fact, at my last employer, that's what I did. After being there for about three months and gaining trust from the team, um, I asked to switch my hours from eight to five to six to three. And it was so amazing. I was taking the train here in New York. Nobody's on the trains, right? So I got a seat all the time. Um, I had two hours of extreme productivity before other people started coming into the office. And then I would leave at three o'clock with the sun still up come home, take a nap, eat dinner, and then I would work on my business in the evening. I was working the same exact amount of hours as everyone else, but I had shifted my hours to the beginning of the day because I'm actually a morning person. And so it was so powerful. And so do you have the autonomy, even if you were going to work the same amount of hours in the day, do you have autonomy to actually uh, work when you want to work, when you actually perform at your highest? This is a really key uh, to freedom. Um, you could also consider this around seasonal work. This is not just the day to day, but seasonal. There's people who don't want to work that much in the summer. Teachers, for example, right? I want to be able to travel, be with my kids and things of that nature in the summer. So I love the teaching profession as a result of that. Now my September to June is, is hard because I have to be on for 30 students every single hour, right? But I get three, I still get paid and I'm off for three months, right? Higher education is the same way. So when you wanna work and actually um, thinking about your work in that way is another degree of freedom that some people have and some people don't. The next one is where you wanna work. Where you wanna work. And I mean this more so not um, in terms of the company uh, that you work with, but actually the city, the place. Right? Some people don't want to be able to work on the beach. Some people don't want to commute. Some people want to work at a big employer, um, but they actually want to work from home. Right. So do you get to work from where you want to work? Right. Um, there's all these flexible work initiatives that are out there, uh, whether you are an entrepreneur who's dictating those terms for your team or you are an employee. <clears throat> do you have access to that to determine where you want to work? As long as you get the work done, uh, I like grow results only work environment. Are you in a results only work environment where it doesn't matter how much face time you have in the office, how many how many hours you're sitting there looking at the uh, screen in front of people and typing on the keyboard? All that matters is whether or not you're getting the results right. And uh, if you are getting the results, you can work from absolutely anywhere that you desire. Do you have that degree of freedom? So again, these are degrees of freedom when it comes to work. The next one is how hard, how hard. I think we all believe that we have say over how hard that we work, but there's some companies out there and even my own company when I first started where I actually didn't have control over, I had control over how hard, but I forgot I had control over how hard I was working and therefore I was putting in 80 hour weeks, right? When there is there are entrepreneurs out there who were building similar businesses to me, but building them smarter and only putting in 40 hours. And then there are people, uh, employees, where there's uh, one company, two employees, one's putting in 80, the other one's putting in 40, um, they're getting paid the exact same, and the one who's putting in 40 is more efficient and having greater results um, in terms of pay, performance, right, and productivity. So how hard, right? Um, oftentimes, how hard is determined by what we perceive as external expectations from clients, from a boss, from an employer, from the market, right? Usually that's what's driving us to work hard and try to put our pedal to the metal 100% uh, of the time and, and try to give 110% 100% of the time. There's no such thing as 110%. There isn't. You can only give 100% of what you actually have. Now you can increase that capacity of 100% to this instead of this, but there's no such thing as 110%. If you ever give 110% for one moment, guess what? It, that 10% is gonna find its way back into your life somehow, whether you get knocked off your feet, whether you get sick, um, 
that 10% is going to make up for itself in your life. You can't just operate at 110%. You are only operating at 100%. And you're probably not even operating at 100%, though you may think it, right? So you choosing how hard uh, you can work at, at certain moments. Let's say um, you have uh, a sick relative that you need to care for, or you are starting to take care of your parents or something like that. And um, do you have the freedom to actually slow down the pace of work, of the flow of work, right? Um, and have you actually developed the leadership skills to empower others to help you get that work done, right? So how hard um, is there? And then this is a big one uh, for people, and, and a lot of people don't have this one, which is how much you work. How hard is like effort? How hard is like effort? I'm trying to put the pedal in the middle at all times. How much is time? How much is time? <laughs> You may only want to work 20 hours a week. And imagine if uh, imagine if you actually design your life in that way. You know, Parkinson's law, and in fact, I only think the average employee works 20 hours a week, honestly. Um, Parkinson's law suggests that work expands the field space and time, right? So if I give you two hours to take a test that only takes one hour, uh, what tends to happen? We fill up that entire space and we turn in the test at one hour and 40, uh, 59 minutes. If I give you an hour to take the same exact test, you will complete it and you get equal results, right? Work expands the field space and time. Guess what? The 40 hour work week is broken because every work, every work week doesn't create 40 hours of work. <laughs> every work week does not require 40 hours of work. There are some that require 50. There are some that require 20. There are busy seasons and things of that nature. But uh, when we are in any kind of employment context or even entrepreneur context. We just believe that we need to be on for 40, 50 hours just because uh, somebody else is out there trying to eat our lunch, right? Um, and so these are kind of the degrees of freedom that I think you can have at work. And some people have this, this, and this. Other people have this, this, and this. And I think to the extent that you can negotiate and, um, and actually demonstrate uh, your power, right? And not let any organization have power over you, including your own. Yes, I know entrepreneurs that are enslaved by their own organizations. Um, I think this will increase your freedom. So <clears throat> I wanna share with you three ways to actually increase these things um, before we go. And um, the first one is if you're an employee, um, it's called managing up. Uh, we hear about managing down when you become a leader, but you actually have to manage up. Uh, for an entrepreneur, what managing up looks like, um, if you don't have a board of directors, is really getting clear on uh, what are the three metrics that uh, my work is actually measured by? What are the three metrics that I need to be focused on every single day? And every activity that you do, be focused on moving the needle on those three metrics. When I had a traditional job, um, I had a piece of paper, I had a piece of paper I don't have any blank paper here. I had a piece of paper and I had a dashboard on that piece of paper, just like a car dashboard. And every meeting I would have my boss, it would only be focused on that piece of paper. These are the metrics that you told me or define my success here. And you can see that this week I moved those metrics. That was how I managed that relationship. This is how I manage up. And that way you don't let personalities or anything get into the way because you have evidence that you are moving the needle forward. A lot of times we just show up and we believe that the number of hours that we're showing up is determining our success. But no, you need to get clear with uh, your board of directors or your manager what your metrics of success are in the organization. The next thing you have to recognize is that you have to train people how to treat you. You have to train people how to treat you, right? There's nobody who automatically knows how to treat you. This also goes in the dating context. You think that somebody should open the door for you, somebody should do this for you or whatnot. Um, you have to train people how to do that. You can't just assume that people know how to treat you. And so this actually ties in to managing up. That's your responsibility. And I want you to be aware that you train people how to treat you. This is for employees and entrepreneurs um, just by your actions. So if I respond as an entrepreneur, if I respond to a client at 2 a.m., then what I've done is I've set a precedent in their mind that I am someone that will get out of bed, right? at 2 a.m., leave my wife in good sleep to show up for my client at 2 a.m. And guess what? I'm gonna start getting more emails at 2 a.m. because I am tr training them that that is okay to do, 
right? And so if you are find yourself in that kind of relationship with your team, your colleagues, or your clients, then you actually have to renegotiate and get out of that trap that you've actually set up because you didn't have to respond to that email at 2 a.m. That was a choice that you made. And in making that choice, um, whether it was conscious or unconscious, um, you were setting a precedent and training them that it's okay to email me at 2 a.m., right? And then, so I never get mad at my customers or my clients or my students when they do something like that because except for the, uh, not the first, because the first time they didn't know. And then the second time, um, that's on me. I did something that allowed them to think it was okay to do this to my organization or communicate with me in this way. I take full responsibility for that, okay? And then finally, um, <coughs> you want to uh, get clear on what your unique value is, right? There are tons of people who may have your particular job title. Uh, there are tons of people who may be starting a similar business uh, as you. You wanna find out what is actually unique about you, right? And you want to focus as much of your time and energy in those areas as possible and develop your personal or, or professional brand around that thing, right? I said it before, we tend to get great at things that we hate. And guess what? When you get great at something, your, per, your brand gets formed around that. And so you need to get clear on what it is that you are great at and what you want to attract more of and develop that skill and intentionally curate your brand. Not just wait to be discovered by the industry or by uh, your manager or executives or whatnot, but that you are actually out there intentionally curating your brand through your action. Right. So you are creating a dashboard that is allowing you to manage up. Right. You are um, uh, training people how to treat you. And then you are being intentional about curating your brand um, amongst anybody who interacts with you so that you only attract the things that you actually love. So this is how I think you increase your degrees of freedom at work. Again, there are degrees of freedom in every aspect of our lives, from uh, money to our, our health, um, to our relationships. Um, but in terms of work, I believe that these are the six uh, ways you can actually measure your degrees of freedom. And I gave you three strategies to try to um, do that day by day by day, one day at a time. All right. So, again, this is Julian Gordon with another episode of Daily Jewels, where I drop nuggets of wisdom to help you become more and more free. I hope that this episode has blessed you, and I will see you again soon. All right? Peace. I hope these mindsets, metaphors, and methodologies blessed you. If you desire more freedom, go to GetFreeNow.com to subscribe to the show on iTunes, YouTube, or Facebook, and get four of my best courses in the Freedom School for 100% free.